The pages of history are no stranger to bizarre amalgamations, many of them from Greek mythology. Since the Bronze Age, the merged silhouettes of horse and human have captured our imagination. As legend has it, the centaur is a creature of contradiction, both outward and inward, a fusion of wisdom and savagery, civilization and brutality. The Greeks placed the centaur's origin in the mountains of Thessaly, where legendary teachers like Chiron shared knowledge with heroes, even as their relatives engaged in acts of violence and chaos. But I will say from the outset, my valued listener, that what I discovered beneath Mount Pelion defies all conventional understanding of vertebrate biology. The fossilized remains I encountered there suggest something far more profound than mythology, a creature whose very existence challenges everything we thought we knew about evolutionary history. What follows here is not yet another retelling of an ancient myth. I present to you instead a scientific examination of a creature that nature crafted and that something else attempted to perfect. The legends of the centaur need little introduction. Half-human, half-horse creatures that have captured imagination for millennia. And yet, as with many myths, the details prove more complex than popular depictions might suggest. The most famous account tells of their violent clash with the Lapiths, a human tribe who had invited the centaurs to a wedding feast. But the centaurs, after some rounds of wine, attempted to carry off all the women, including the bride. The Lapiths, aided by renowned hero Theseus, fought the centaurs and managed to succeed in victory. This tale, now referred to as the Centauramaki, came to symbolize the eternal conflict between civilization, represented by the Lapiths, and savagery. But not every centaur was known as a brute. Chiron, for example, was known to be a wise teacher of heroes, skilled in medicine and astronomy. From his cave on Mount Pelion, he was said to have tutored many of Greece's legendary figures, including Achilles and Jason. Pelion. Little did I know just how significant that name would come to be. You see, my valued listener, as I had conducted my examination of the scrolls stored in the labyrinth at Gnosis, I had initially dismissed a reference to Thessaly as incidental, a mere geographical notation among the more complex diagrams and ritual descriptions. But something about that passage struck me as odd. Unlike the detailed chronologies of experimentation, this section described what appeared to be observation. Allison took the liberty of deciphering much of the ancient Greek, she is much more linguistically skilled than I, and found references to creatures in the northern mountains with an almost reverent tone. The authors of these scrolls, the ones I've come to call the keepers of the labyrinth, seem to be documenting not just their own work, but something else. Though we were dealing with little more than archaeological fragments, I suspected that the answers to my questions lie somewhere in those mountains, and so it was that I, along with Allison, traveled to Thessaly. In all honesty, I was shocked to find that our first inquiries in the region were not met with bewilderment or dismissal. Instead, local farmers spoke of strange sounds in the night. Hikers described unusual tracks. What caught my attention was the geographic consistency. Most unusual creature sightings tend to scatter randomly across a region, but these centered around a specific network of valleys in the Pelian Range. And yet, despite all of this, we uncovered no physical evidence. That is, until we almost literally stumbled upon a single hair sample, deep within a remote cave system, the location of which will remain classified. In short, the hair's genetic markers were unusual enough to warrant further investigation. However, given the unsanctioned nature of this particular investigation, I wasn't able to pursue analysis through the usual channels, and for a time at least, it appeared that we had hit a dead end. It was the caves themselves that eventually led to a breakthrough. The Cretan scrolls shed some light on this, but ultimately, our discovery of an extensive network of subterranean caverns was mostly a matter of luck. There were no living creatures there, no signs of habitation. What we saw instead, at least at first, were signs of ancient excavation and the fossilized remains of a creature that would eventually shatter my carefully constructed worldview. It is at this point that I must beg your indulgence. What I am about to describe will seem far-fetched even by the standards of my previous investigations. But it was there. As I've discovered firsthand, the worlds of science and mythology are complex and ever-changing, and each exploration leads to a thousand new trails to follow. 
Novelists, video game designers, and dungeon masters know this as well, and they all know the pain of simply keeping track of everything as they make it ready to share with the world. But with World Anvil, even the most complex world building is a breeze. With 25 world building article templates, you can write up detailed accounts and format them in wiki style presentations. Then map out everything from species and races to regions, characters, diseases, and magic systems, and effortlessly link them together with the built in auto linker function. Plus, World Anvil is always adding new features. For example, their built-in writing experience has just been fully revamped with block-based editing, easy image insertion, and much more. So now it is truly what you see is what you get, and I for one am loving it. And once you've begun to forge your world, all of your entries are completely searchable. It makes it so much easier than sifting through documents and folders just to try to remember your character's birthday. Seriously, with World Anvil, the only thing holding you back is your own imagination. Now, if you want to check out World Anvil for yourself, which I highly recommend, simply visit worldanvil.com and use code POTATO at checkout for a staggering 51% off any yearly plan. So if you're a novelist, a dungeon master planning your next campaign, or you're just looking for a place to build out the ideas that have been rattling around in your head, World Anvil is not only the place to start, it's the place to grow and share all of your hard work. Link is in the description. We found multiple specimens preserved with remarkable clarity in the limestone. However, they weren't what the legends would have led me to expect. Quite unlike popular depiction, this was no human equine amalgamation. Before me lay the remains of something else entirely, a six-limbed predator. I would later name it Agihexippus Thessalicus, and it came to consume me. What follows is a detailed account of the specimens we examined, multiple complete skeletons with fragments of preserved soft tissues, likely owing to the conditions of the cave that held it. On average, these specimens measured roughly five feet tall at the shoulder and six to seven feet in total length. Agihexippus thessalicus is, as previously mentioned, a six-limbed vertebrate with an elevated anterior segment, a bowel plan which, to my knowledge, has no physical precedent in nature. It's difficult to know where to even begin. Perhaps the first question is how an organism with six limbs could be feasible from a biomechanical standpoint. And this question would lead to what is arguably this organism's most impressive skeletal feature, its vertebral column. Indeed, supporting six limbs while maintaining an elevated anterior segment presents unique problems of balance, weight distribution, and coordination that likely required several key adaptations. One can see the first such innovation in the spine's gradual, elongated curve. Unlike the abrupt transitions we see in modern quadrupeds, this smooth curve would have distributed forces evenly across the entire column. The neural spines maintain consistent height throughout, suggesting an arrangement of paraspinal muscles that provided stability through tension, much like the cables of a suspension bridge. To this point, unlike the relatively simple arrangement seen in most vertebrates, the creature's epaxial muscles appear to have developed into distinct deep and superficial layers, preserved as differentiated bands of tissue. The deeper muscles attachment points would facilitate fine postural control, while the superficial layer's broad insertions would have allowed for explosive movement. Preserved tissue structure also reveals a rectus abdominis developed into separate anterior and posterior segments, bridged by a complex of oblique muscles. This is another impressive aspect of this organism's anatomy. Without this arrangement, the elevated anterior portion would have created unsustainable strain on the spine. Combined with the long, gracile tail acting as a counterbalance, this musculoskeletal arrangement would have allowed Thessalicus to maintain its distinctive posture without excessive muscular effort. Of course, these systems would have been nothing without equally sophisticated limb adaptations. And so it is with Thessalicus. Beginning anterior, these limbs exhibit four functional digits, and the preserved joint surfaces and muscle attachment points indicate an elevated range of motion, which matches wear patterns we found on primitive tools discovered alongside the fossils. In short, these limbs were undoubtedly used primarily for manipulation, gathering, and tool use. It could very well be that the reports of an ancient species of bow-wielding hybrids, so to speak, had some merit after all. Of course, there may also be another explanation, but we will return to that in time. The middle and posterior pairs of limbs likely bore the full responsibility for locomotion, each displaying a reduction to three digits, which is a clear cursorial adaptation. It goes without saying that while these limbs are clearly not as similar to horses as the legends would have us believe, they do bear a striking resemblance to early equid ancestors like Eohippus with digits and joint structures optimized for uneven terrain. I will take a brief interlude here to describe what I anticipate to be a burning question in your mind, value listener, just as it was in mine. 
How could such a remarkable body plan have evolved in the first place? In the absence of any direct fossil evidence of any early stages, I believe that we can make some inferences. Keep in mind, however, that at this time, these hypotheses are just that. The first stage of Thessalicus development likely began with an early aquatic form, perhaps during the initial vertebrate transition to land wherein this branch appears to have retained an additional set of paired fins that would later develop into the middle limbs. The transition from fin to limb would have followed similar developmental patterns to those we see in early tetrapods, but occurring across three pairs rather than two. In any case, the hypothesized intermediate stages of Thessalicus lineage are undoubtedly where environmental pressures had the most impact. One could argue well that possessing six legs isn't better than four, yet instead of losing or reducing its middle limbs as one might expect, as we've seen, Thessalicus appears to have repurposed its anterior pair entirely for manipulation while retaining four legs for locomotion. This solution, though seemingly more complex, must have provided significant advantages in its mountain environment. But the most profound transformation would have occurred in the fourth and fifth stages, where the interior segment's elevation might have begun as a simple behavioral adaptation, rising up to scan for prey or threats, or perhaps reaching for food, before, as the interior limbs specialized further, becoming a fixed postural change. And yet, the sophistication of Thessalicus's adaptation suggests a long history, one that by all normal expectations should have left considerable evidence across multiple geological strata. The fact that it hasn't, at least to public knowledge, is frankly disturbing. But for now, let us return to what I can say with certainty. We have seen that the typical depiction of a centaur is one of jarring juxtaposition, that of man and beast. But as we've also seen, Thessalicus displays a clear homogeneity across its entire body, and nowhere is this more apparent than in its locomotory anatomy. To begin with, the anterior shoulder structure shows a complete departure from its locomotor origins. The scapulae are broad and distinctly flattened, providing expansive attachment points for muscles controlling its presumably dexterous forelimbs. Most notably, the glenoid cavity is oriented to allow an extraordinary range of motion more reminiscent of primates than any cursorial mammal. But most astoundingly, the creature appears to have developed what is essentially a double pelvic structure, a modified anterior hip girdle for the middle limb pair integrated with a more traditional posterior pelvis. Between these two pelvic components, dense ridges of bone indicate what would have been substantial ligament attachment points, thereby creating a framework that would have distributed forces evenly during rapid locomotion. Ultimately, what is striking to me about these specimens is simply the integration of the musculoskeletal system. Antagonistic muscle groups likely worked in concert across all major body segments, perhaps most notably in the evidence of broad fascial sheets running obliquely between the anterior and middle limb sets. These would have acted like tension cables, automatically adjusting to maintain stability as the creature shifted its weight or reached for prey. In short, this is a creature whose every anatomical feature serves a clear and fascinating purpose. Unfortunately, without living specimens to observe, I can say virtually nothing about Thessalicus' level of intelligence with complete certainty. However, I am able to make some inferences based on certain endocranial castings. First, the cranial capacity and internal structure indicate areas of likely neural enhancement, particularly in regions we associate with motor control and coordination. Second, the size of the vertebral canal and its associated foramina could have accommodated substantial nerve pathways to all three pairs of limbs. As would be expected, the size and arrangement of these neural passages, particularly in the anterior region, indicate enhanced innervation to the forelimbs. Finally, based on certain artifacts recovered along with the fossilized remains, I can say with some confidence that this species was intelligent. The cave system yielded numerous preserved tools showing sophisticated manufacturing processes, including carved bone implements with distinct wear patterns which, to me, strongly suggest prolonged use for specific tasks. I will now describe our findings of Thessalicus's internal anatomy which presents several fascinating solutions to the challenges of supporting its unique body plan. For example, perhaps somewhat unexpectedly, the lungs are housed in the anterior thoracic cavity. I suspect that this placement is advantageous as it positions the primary respiratory apparatus closer to the brain. This arrangement likely evolved as Thessalicus's ancestors gradually developed their elevated anterior segment. As part of this process, as the front portion rose, the lungs would have simply shifted with it. Additionally, the diaphragm is more refined than what we see in traditional tetrapods. 
Rather than a single muscular sheet, it appears to have developed into a segmented structure that would have allowed for more precise control over breathing mechanics and could have led to increased overall efficiency. The anterior thoracic cavity also housed the heart. Residual cardiac tissues lead me to believe that the heart was relatively large with thicker ventricular walls. Additionally, preserved vessels indicate increased elasticity, particularly of those serving the brain, an adaptation which would have been crucial for rapid elevation changes. Due to the location of these crucial organs, the anterior ribcage is sufficiently robust, remarkably similar to that of a human. The stomach and primary digestive organs, on the other hand, are positioned within the posterior thoracic cavity, which is protected by its own distinct set of ribs. In contrast to the more rigid anterior ribcage, however, this structure was likely more flexible and with wider spacing between the ribs. This would have allowed for digestive expansion while still providing protection and muscle attachment points. The digestive system itself shows clear omnivorous adaptation with what I believe to be a slight predatory emphasis. Examinations of Thessalicus's dentition match what we observe in the preserved gut structure, as the teeth exhibit a combination of slicing and grinding surfaces. It appears that the stomach itself was relatively large but simple, and food was likely broken down mechanically rather than by extended chemical digestion. And as food was ingested, it quite clearly would have moved through an elongated esophagus spanning both body segments before reaching the stomach. Though intestinal tissues were not well preserved in the specimens we examined, it stands to reason, especially given the capacious posterior cavity, that the small intestine was long and efficiently coiled within the posterior cavity and would have allowed for efficient extraction of nutrients from both meat and plant material. And so it is that, in large part, this concludes our findings in regards to those particular specimens. But as monumental as this was, it would not be our last discovery. As our excavation continued deeper into the cave system, we began finding evidence of activity. At first, these seemed to be the typical archaeological remains, more tools, pottery shards, and the usual detritus of prehistoric occupation. But as we pressed in further, the artifacts became different, more elaborate. It started with the discovery of a sealed chamber, its entrance carved with symbols that were unsettlingly similar to those I'd seen in Crete. We managed to unseal the chamber, and it was, in fact, easier than we might have thought. But what lay within suggested that the Cretan cult's attempts at fleshcraft were little more than crude imitations of something far more ancient and far more advanced. The walls of this chamber were covered in diagrams of unsettling sophistication, scratched into the stone like chalk on a board. The diagrams quite clearly depicted the very same skeletal configuration we had only just discovered, the modified diaphragm, the precise arrangement of the neural pathways. We stood in awe. These were not some primitive cave paintings. This was art. And I, I have yet to unravel all of what we discovered there, and I hesitate to even say it aloud. Alongside the drawings of Thessalicus's natural anatomy were systematic modifications, outlined alterations to the anterior ribcage to accommodate larger lungs, reinforcement of the cervical vertebrae, limb elongation, enlargement of the brain case. Bound pages lay on stone tables at the wall's base, seemingly untouched by time, each one layered in heavy script I didn't recognize, accompanied by still more anatomical drawings. The organism they depicted was like Thessalicus in many ways, but more gracile, for lack of a better word, more refined. We took many photographs, but I fear that they will never now see the light of day. But as we did so, the flash of bulbs like lightning against a stony sky, we heard a sound. Something else was in that cave with us. My valued listener, I'm afraid that this recording must end here. The full account of what I encountered in those deeper chambers and the profound implications for our understanding of both evolution and human history are best not committed to this format. What I can say is this. It has become clear to me that the Cretan cult's attempts at fleshcraft were merely fumbling imitations of something far more unbelievable and far more ancient. And that something still lives. The story doesn't end here. You can find more at the link in the description. Thank you for watching, and remember, you matter.